Hey, welcome back to the Wisdom Workshop Library. It's Sean Waters, a very special edition of the library sessions today. I want to thank Penguin Random House for sending me this advanced copy of Jenny O'Dell's Saving Time, Discovering a Life Beyond the Clock. I got this book about four months ago, which enabled me to read it and give this book summary on the day that it launches. And I want to thank you if you're liking and subscribing. Appreciate it. it helps the channel grow. I want to see your comments down below. There's a ton of stuff in this book but I, I, I think it's, it's a good book. So the book is basically divided into two sets of chapters. The first kind of outlines the problem of the limited way that we look at time as money and the history kind of like a Foucault analysis of the historical constructs that gave us ideas like time management, worker efficiency, built off the penitentiary and prison system, as well as other ways of understanding time as a commodity that can be traded or sold or or bought <clears throat> this is like her life on the clock that she uses and that's the first two chapters of the book which is um, how we got to this point of thinking about time as money it's super in-depth and really interesting for the historical and um, you know language nerds she kind of transitions in from the chapter into self timer how we time ourselves and the the paradigms of time management to match our efficiency or to create um, more leisure time for ourselves, and then leads into this the next two chapters are arguably my favorite chapter three can there be leisure which is an investigation of how we approach leisure as being in time as a recharge ready for work or a qualitatively different way of existing in time that does not have to do with the clock. And then chapter four is putting time back in its place, which she starts to connect her argument for bioregionalism, which she did in her first book, um, How to Do Nothing, Resisting the Attention Economy, which we'll come back to as one of the quotes. This is how time and space are interrelated, particularly in landscapes that measure or that reveal, have inside of them layers of time. And this is the transition, how I read this outline, where she begins to really open up to the different ways that we might engage with time. So this isn't a prescription of how we should live um, beyond the clock. She is kind of saying we should not strictly live our lives on this time this money clock and that there are other ways to exist in time and she spends the second half of the book kind of exploring um, different ways that people have thought about it and how she ends up thinking about it the book is highly political in the sense it has to do with how time ownership expresses and reflects racial social power dynamic structures of this of a kind of hegemonic idea that is used to kind of exploit, extract as much labor from work. And it has very, it's also really interested in how we're dealing with the climate crisis that's happening. The narratives around time that oil companies are using to delay um, and deflect. So while she draws, does draw on some really heavy realities and some really heavy anxieties and injustices and what is really brutally inhumane about how we relate to time and how we relate to space and how we relate to each other and as that's playing out on these huge climate and social catastrophes that are unfolding before our eyes this is ultimately a hopeful book it's ultimately a she says a panic pan panic <laughs> try again this is a panoramic assault on nihilism it is a wide-ranging ode to the possibility that we interact with time in qualitative rather than quantitative ways. This is from the introduction. Nor has the clock, even if it runs our days and lifetimes, ever completely conquered our psyches. Under the grid of the timetable, we each know many other varieties of time. The stretchy quality of waiting and desire the way present may suddenly feel marbled with childhood memory, the slow but sure procession of a pregnancy, or the time it takes to heal from injuries, physical or emotional. As planet-bound animals, we are living inside shortening and lengthening days, inside the weather where certain flowers and scents come back, at least for now, to visit a year older self. Sometimes time is not money, but these things instead. Indeed, it's this very awareness of overlapping temporalities that invites a deep suspicion 
that we are living on the wrong clock. Joseph Piper on leisure, favorite quote number two. It's here that I want to return to Joseph Piper's leisure, the basis of culture, which I mentioned in the introduction. In marked contrast to an experience to be consumed or a goal to be met, Piper's leisure is something closer to a state of mind or an emotional posture, one that, like falling asleep, can be achieved only by letting go. It involves a mixture of awe and gratitude that, quote, springs precisely from our inability to understand, from our recognition of the mysterious nature of the universe, end quote. It opens onto and finds peace in chaos and things larger than the self, the way you might feel when looking at an enormous cliff face or a sunrise, for that matter, as, quote, a form of silence, as, as, quote, a form of silence, which is the prerequisite of an apprehension of reality, end quote, true leisure requires the kind of emptiness in which you remember the fact of your own aliveness. Hmm. All right, hey everybody, welcome back to the Wisdom Workshop Library. My name is Sean Waters, and I'm the host today. We are talking about Saving Time by Jenny Odell, which is about... Um, discovering a life beyond the clock. Um, if you have a little one, um, I'm sure they'll help you do that.